You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Nolan Gray. He is a writer for MarketUrbanism.com. Nolan, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. Before we get into our main topic of discussion, can you give a quick description of what market urbanism is? Sure. So in a nutshell, market urbanism is the synthesis of classical liberal economics and uh, political thought with uh, an appreciation for the benefits of urban life. So in effect, market urbanists are typically classical liberals who live in cities or appreciate the economic and social or cultural value that cities contribute to life. So what we're interested in is the issue specific to cities. So that would include housing affordability, that would include transportation, a whole range of issues. But the the general idea is to apply the classical liberal framework, the toolbox, to these issues. So you wrote an article titled, Reclaiming Redneck Urbanism, What Urban Planners Can Learn from Trailer Parks. And, I mean, that's a provocative title, and it's a provocative piece, you don't usually hear a lot about trailer parks, and what you do hear is usually usually bad, usually kind of dismissive, but you're not only saying good things about trailer parks, you're holding them up as a model for urban development. So for people who maybe haven't lived in or even visited a trailer park, could you describe what a trailer park is and what it's like? Sure. So, so there are two actors involved in a trailer park. First would be the renter. So... This is the person who is occupying a unit. So in most cases, they would buy or rent a mobile home. They can buy them new or used, just like cars or housing, typical site-built housing. And by site-built housing, I mean housing where a construction crew went out to a specific lot and built the house. And that's contrasted with mobile homes where they're typically built in factories. So there are certain efficiency gains there. That's one side of the transaction, and that person pays both for their mobile home and also they rent land from the park management. The other actor is the park manager, and so one of the services that they provide is, of course, the land, and they collect rent as part of that. But another part of the service that they provide is private governance. So typically, they enforce a code of rules that all residents have to follow, and sometimes these are pretty hands-off, so they might be basic cleanliness and um, safety standards. They might restrict access into and out of the, uh, the park, just like you might see with a more affluent gated community or an apartment complex. But sometimes they actually go deeper than the typical neighborhood. So oftentimes, especially in places like Florida or other sunny states where people like to retire, a lot of times they'll be restricted to certain age groups. So for example, retirees, sometimes they'll be regulated in such a way to make them more family friendly. So they'll have playgrounds as public goods. They'll have maybe a little park etc. So that's the sort of transaction at the heart of the trailer park. And uh, really what I'm making the case here is that this is an interesting social phenomenon that because most of the people who write and act in the space have probably neither lived nor even been into a trailer park, it's probably missed in a lot of the literature. So I, I actually, I have been to a trailer park or a mobile home community. I have a personal connection to this because my father-in-law actually owns and manages two mobile home communities. So I get what you mean by the private governance. For instance, you, you pull up to, you know, you drive along the road to get there. And, you know, of course, the speed limit's 60 kilometers an hour, but it's a rural road so everyone goes 70 but as soon as you mm-hmm. pull into that mobile home community you know you got to you got to go slow right down they have their own speed limit their the road is the street within it is very narrow there are kids playing and so you you slow right down you go 15 kilometers an hour and they enforce that you know and mm-hmm. they're mowing lawns they're you know and then they're managing disputes between uh tenants uh, so i i totally get that and and it is contrary to maybe what you see in the media it is, he he does provide a nice place to live and at a very low cost i think particularly too compared to the alternatives for a lot of low income families yeah yeah that's the big issue right it's we we shouldn't compare a trailer park or a mobile home community to fancy apartments in major urban centers that of course those people could never afford right 
So in, in your article, you refer to uh, something you call the United States century-long war on low-income housing. So what, what policies does that refer to? Sure. So this has been something that we've been really interested in on the website. Uh, Emily Hamilton, uh, another writer for Market Urbanism, she's been writing pieces on all the restrictions on what many would consider low-quality housing. So at the beginning of the last century, these were actually quite common. So they would have been boarding houses. They might have been residential hotels where you don't necessarily pay month to month, but you maybe pay for shorter periods, uh, or just low quality apartments and houses in general. Over the course of the last century, nearly every major city in the U.S. has banned a lot of these housing types. There's maybe the generous motive of the people genuinely wanted to build better housing. Uh, so the idea was you tear down these old you know, tenement housing units and you replace them with higher quality housing. In a lot of cases, that didn't happen. And so you had good intentions, but bad results. And then in other cases, it really was just an, an explicit attempt to keep the poor out of many cities and many neighborhoods. So one of the, I would say, problems with land use regulation in America is that oftentimes people can regulate the minutia of their neighborhood. And oftentimes they use this to keep out perhaps certain income groups that they don't like. And as a proxy, unfortunately, in American history, this is often racial groups that people don't like. So not only do you see this with certain forms of housing that most people would find repulsive today, like tenement housing, it might have its role at certain levels of development. But this even happens with uh, apartments. So a lot of times cities will, if they permit apartments at all, they'll place extra restrictions on them. They'll say you have to provide parking. They'll say you have to provide a certain square footage. Same thing for housing. A lot of times they'll have minimum lot sizes. Uh, they'll have minimum home sizes. And all these things increase the cost of housing. And so that's why I found trailer parks so particularly interesting is because not only are they some sort of, are they a, a market provided form of housing that is relatively inexpensive. It's designed for low income people by and large, whether they're retirees who are living on a fixed income or just, you know, people with low wages who can't afford maybe a larger site built home or a larger apartment. But I became interested in that not only for the, for the market element of it, but also because they're exempt from a lot of these rules. So in many cases, trailer parks have very tiny minimum lot requirements, if any at all. They typically don't have setbacks. And in many cases, the club goods that are required to be bundled in with the unit, so this might be parking, this might be like a driveway of some kind, a lot of times they're provided by the park management according to their own perception of what the market demand is. Yeah, there's one other interesting exception to the the restrictions on low quality low income housing and that is dorms university dorms so, so a lot of these people uh -huh. who they'll say i don't want people to live in in these low quality homes i don't want people to live in 50 square feet i think everyone deserves a one family home or or you know deserves a larger place to live and then they'll send their kids to university and to live in you know, a, a tiny, <laughs> tiny room with a bed and a desk and a shared bathroom and a shared kitchen, which they they would, you know, there's sort of there's, there's some cognitive dissonance there. And they're paying good money for it, too. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, part of the reason why it's a why they're trailer parks and not manufactured home community. So there's a distinction between a mobile home and a manufactured home. One of them has you know, an axle and some wheels under it, which, of course, you cover up and you can't see. And the other one, you know, you take the wheels off once you put it down in its place. But I've heard that although you, you have to pay for the wheels and stuff, that makes it very different under the tax code. So it, are, are taxes and regulations very different for houses that, that have some wheels on them? Yeah, this is one of the really strange things with a lot of this regulation. So lately, these tiny homes have become very popular. And this is kind of what started my thinking on this, because there has been a lot of talk about permitting tiny homes in cities. And a, a lot of the focus was on trailer area zone for trailer parks. They'd be perfect for tiny homes. But a lot of the uh, many cities actually regulate such that the home has to have wheels to qualify for some of these regulations. So you see really wacky circumstances in which people were having to put wheels on their tiny homes that they never had any intention or desire to put on wheels, or they'll put them on a trailer as sort of the last minute. 
So you have this kind of weird situation where this regulatory framework was built up around mobile homes and maybe trailers uh, that actually would be more mobile and maybe be primarily for vacationers or for seasonal workers. But they're actually, as it turns out, is a lot of demand for the kind of zoning that you see in trailer parks. And so now you have this perverse situation where people are, are actively putting wheels on otherwise wheelless units just to get into these neighborhoods where they can have their small home or where they can maybe live tighter in with their neighbors or they can share certain club goods. Yeah, yeah. You um, quote some statistics from the New World Economics blog, which I'll uh, I'll just read right now. They said, if you had 70% home plots, 15% roads, 15% shared amenities like parks and squares, 1,000 square foot plots, and 2.5 people per household, that works out to a population density of 46,000 people per square mile with one or two story construction. At this level of density, compared to about 9,000 per mile for the, per square mile, that is, for the denser Los Angeles suburb, you could easily have a lot of neat commercial stuff, bars, restaurants, shops, schools, etc., within walking distance. So those are, of course, the, the just some ballpark figures for, for the level of density of a trailer park. And what's really impressive is that they achieve five times the density of a Los Angeles suburb, but they don't build up. They don't they don't have any skyscrapers. They're just one or two stories. And what they mention about uh bars, restaurants, shops, I guess the one thing about trailer parks is that they're still not really a mix of commercial and residential, which is something that you saw in cities before the rise of zoning. So it is so I I suppose there still are certain regulations about running a business within these trailer parks, are there? Yeah, that's right. Typically, although they're exempt from a lot of more design-oriented land use regulations, in most cases, the use regulation itself is still very strict. So in most trailer parks, you can't operate a business, you can't have a little auto shop, you couldn't actually formally have your business there. Oftentimes, this is overcome, particularly in, in urban trailer parks, you often see this overcome by trailer parks being located in um, areas that have some degree of mixture of use. So the trailer park that I focus on in my hometown of Lexington, uh, it's actually quite close to a lot of commercial centers, many of which are catered toward lower income consumers. So I think there's like a there's like a Dollar General, you know, there's a inexpensive grocery stores nearby. And there's also manufacturing and, and and some sort of light industry nearby. The bit about density is really interesting because you don't see densities even remotely as high as you see in trailer parks in most American or Canadian cities. So it's, it's kind of ironic that this sort of traditional form of development of low rise, but still relatively compact um, neighborhoods, it's gone everywhere else. And now I, I would guess that there's probably a higher demand for this now as there's more interest in urban living. But it's survived in this area that maybe due to regulatory neglect, I really don't know, has survived in trailer parks. And this is important, too, because you need certain levels of density to have functional urban neighborhoods. You need certain you need a certain threshold of people within you know a square mile to support things like bars, to support things like restaurants and stores and shops, to support things like businesses coming into the neighborhood. And so ironically, around these neighborhoods where you have some degree of density, you actually have uh, more mixtures of uses. Yeah, I, if you've ever been to Europe, it's it's a lot like that where you have all these one and two story buildings, but they're packed together on the lots. They don't have the big yard that you see in most of America mm -hmm. and Canada. And those are very walkable cities. It's also very common in Japan. And recently I was writing about Houston. I think you're, you're seeing pretty much the same thing happening in Houston. Now that they've lifted a lot of a whole host of regulations in the nineties that regulated uh, housing density. And there, what you're seeing where there's such a high demand for housing in Houston is you're seeing a lot of townhomes. And uh, just earlier today, I saw a picture of a bunch of very tightly packed mansions on a city block in Houston. And it's interesting because I think what it reveals is that these density restrictions are binding. So a lot of people say, oh, land use regulation is not bad because it generally maps onto consumer preferences. Of course, you can't say that, but 
at least it seems relatively reasonable, right? Mo- everyone, almost everybody wants a, a, a house with a large lawn that's in a cul-de-sac that's on the outer edge of the city that you have to drive to get to anything. But what's interesting is that where these regulations are lifted, there's actually reasonably high demand uh, for this kind of living. And the walkability point, I think, is, is interesting, too, because the big thing about what a lot of our residential regulation has done, where we've forced lot sizes to be a certain size, we've forced, this is more of a transportation planning issue, but we've forced streets to be very wide and to have very tiny sidewalks on the side. Pedestrians are an afterthought. We've created cities that aren't walkable, and that's why I think you're seeing so much demand for the remaining walkable neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. It's There's an irony here in that sometimes you see zoning justified as a way to prevent urban sprawl, but it really seems like it's the cause of urban sprawl rather than the cure to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that cause sprawl in conventional American and and, and I would say probably Canadian Mm -hmm. planning. Minimum parking requirements are a huge one. So even if you as a business owner or as a developer don't think that your consumers want any parking, you still have to build it. Not only does that you know, take up space if it's a lot, but it also makes housing much more expensive. So that puts pressure on developments that are in areas with high land values, and it shifts it to areas with low land values where, oh, the cost of the extra parking is, is not going to destroy the development, or it's not going to make it unaffordable to the target market. Minimum lot sizes are another big one. Uh, height restrictions are quite common. So we could have a debate about whether people want to live in uh, higher densities or more medium densities, like you would see in trailer parks or in a lot of European cities. But even still, you know, these height restrictions, especially in many U.S. and Canadian cities, where in many cases there are no more than two stories max, the density is basically restricted by law. And so we can't really say anything about what the market prefers. Yeah, if you uh, visit New York, I think it's um, there are some neighborhoods where they restrict the height and square footage of these buildings, and you get these really sort of oddly shaped squat rectangular buildings that are pushing right up against the maximum legal size they can be. I think it's Soho that's like that. Uh, And you you just, uh, you sort of wonder, oh, why did they build it that way? And it's, well, because the land is super, super valuable. You don't want to waste any at all, but legally you can't build any bigger than your building. So, So everyone's pushing right up against that restriction. So Jane Jacobs, I actually did a previous episode about the life and work of Jane Jacobs, which I'll link to in the show notes page, economicsdetective.com slash uh, slash trailer, let's say. So Jane Jacobs argued in favor of mixed commercial and residential neighborhoods, which were, of course, the norm before the rise of, of zoning and city planning. And part of her argument was that it allowed the shopkeepers to keep an eye on their shops around the clock, which would do two things. It'd reduce crime, and it would also extend the hours people could do business. I actually have a real-life example of this. Uh, There's a bubble tea place on the corner right near where I live. And when I moved in, one of the first things I noticed about this bubble tea place was that it never seemed to close. It actually, I mean, it does close, but it's open till 11 p.m. some nights and midnight other nights, which is very odd. And the thing about this place is that it's one of very few lots here in Vancouver that is zoned for both multifamily housing and commercial uses. So I think the the people who own that business just live right upstairs and then they have a a bell that rings when you open the door and they come down and they make you a bubble tea <laughs> at 11 p.m. at night. And that's really something that we've lost by saying, okay, you know, you have your commercial district here and then the people who actually work there have to live way out in the suburb. Do you know what the justification was for separating commercial from housing? It's a great question. There's a good book by academic Sonia Hurt called Zoned in the USA. It's focused on the US, but probably a lot of it applies to Canada. Uh, and she talks about why there's this unique and dogmatic focus on separating uses. Part of it is health and safety, and maybe some of the misunderstandings associated with health and safety. So, you know, of course, in the 1900s, early 1900s, you know, it might seem more reasonable to want to separate out industry. Industry was just, it just had more negative externalities back then. Whereas your typical 
you know, industry now is maybe a little bit more sedate. Um, back then, of course, there might have been more pollution or there might have been more noise. So on the one hand, there's the sort of understandable desire to separate uses. But on the other hand, there's, if I remember correctly, she talks about how there was just this fear that children being near groceries would transmit diseases. Or, you know, this was back when people associated foul smells with unhealthiness. So some of it, I would say, is, is reasonable and trying to protect health and safety. And some of it is trying to protect health and safety that is not reasonable. And then some of it, I suspect, is probably just aesthetic. So people had this idea of work and living should be separate, you know. And I suspect a lot of it was strictly lifestyle preferences. But in the book, uh, uh, Hurt talks a lot about the sort of where this quickly becomes untethered from health and safety and, and becomes a goal that's just aspired toward uh, in and of its own right. Yeah, it seems like with some of these things, you sort of build an entrenched uh, group, you know, the city planners or the, the city council, and they just they find their own justifications for things when the when the original justifications go away. So you, mm-hmm. it, it might be just to some extent a, a labor program for city planning graduates. <laughs> Maybe. But and I, I think too it's it's so important to to talk about just how nice that kind of development is of the of the shop above the the apartment. In many cases, as you say, shop owners could live above their their shop. They'd be able to keep an eye on it. They become community characters. It builds social capital. It really allows people to invest in a particular place, as opposed to when they're forcibly, you know, maybe perhaps against their preferences, forced to live in one area and work in another area. Or they're forced, they're forced to, to live quite far away from their business. You know, in the case of the apartment above the shop, which is an extremely common form of development through most of human history and just about the entire world, the benefit is that the shop owner, you know, who's working on a budget doesn't have to buy two separate buildings. They can buy one building. And if the business is so successful that they can buy a home, they could buy a home nearby and they could rent out the apartment above the unit. Uh, so it's a way of incremental development. It's a way of of low cost entrepreneurial activity that unfortunately has been squashed in a lot of cities. I'm reminded of the Simpsons. They had a character named Rick Grimes who had everything, everything went wrong for him. And he lived in an apartment above a bowling alley and below another bowling alley. (laughs) So I mean, I guess that's, that's the example of, of a place you wouldn't want to live, but I think, you know, something like a bubble tea shop or a little grocery, that's not going to be, quite as noisy and uh, lower your standard of living like two bowling alleys. So let's talk a little bit about uh, zoning in major urban areas. I live in Vancouver, which up until recently had some of the highest real estate prices in the world. Actually, that bubble seems to have kind of popped. We um, The sort of public uh, understanding of, of the high prices was that it was the influence of foreign buyers who, I mean, were... We have a lot of people, wealthy people from China who who buy property in Vancouver. And what most locals believe is that they were buying up homes and leaving them empty. And that was the reason we had such high real estate prices. I, I'm skeptical as that of that as the main cause of high real estate. We also have very restrictive zoning. And when you have interest rates very close to zero for a long time, it becomes much cheaper to get a, a higher mortgage and, and people bid up the prices of real estate that way. But what we did is we just recently imposed a 15% tax on foreign real estate buyers, and they basically all pulled out of the market, even pulled out of uh, agreements that they, you know, they were just about to sign the paperwork, and you know, then this 15% tax comes along and they uh, renege and I think overnight, you know, the the real estate prices collapsed twenty percent. So that's kind of a current event. We gotta sort of wait and see what happens there. So there there's two elements to this. There's the whole cyclical home prices moving with the business cycle, and there's the issue of certain cities in particular being just so much more expensive than others. And um, it seems like no one outside of an economics department really would point to zoning as the possible cause, but is there good evidence that zoning is a leading factor in what makes some cities 
you know, Vancouver, coastal California, New York, very expensive and others much less expensive? Yeah, well, I think there's a there's a general academic consensus that tightening land use regulation or, or further restrictions on development increases the cost of housing. So this could be anything from an urban growth boundary that prohibits uh, horizontal expansion to height restrictions that prevent more apartments or or just in general, any kind of density increase. On the one hand, you have the supply that's artificially being restricted, which of course raises costs. And then on the other side, you have compliance costs for the units that are being built. So increasingly, in I think probably a misguided attempt to deal with affordable housing, you're seeing some cities adopt inclusionary zoning mandates. And this is where a certain portion of the units have to be considered affordable, which is below the market rents. The problem with this, of course, is that it's effectively a tax on new development because that's that's a lost potential rent. So the perverse result is that the only units that get built are luxury units, and then those luxury units are right next to affordable units. And so you have this bizarre market where there really isn't any middle. The average person can't actually rent. if Unless you win the lottery in one of these affordable units, you don't actually get to live there, or you can be super wealthy. You were talking about foreign owners, too, and this is an interesting development, I think, that we've seen is I think we've kind of entered a witch hunt phase of housing affordability. So there's this recognition that most of our productive cities in North America, the cities that most people want to live in, this could be Vancouver, San Francisco, uh, New York City, very high demand cities. What you're seeing now is is everything but land use regulation being blamed. Uh, So you're seeing little tiny crusades on Airbnb, for example. You're seeing attacks on, on foreign owners. You are seeing people get angry about luxury development, even though, of course, luxury development is important because, as we know, real estate properties filter down and you need a constant cycle of new high quality development. Otherwise, the market is is going to break down as it has in most cities. And that's why I think it's just so important to keep the focus on this supply restriction. And, and what I think that we're seeing now, on the one hand, you're seeing this sort of the witch hunt among people who maybe own properties in these cities and don't want to increase supply because maybe they implicitly know that that would reduce the value of their property. Certainly not anytime soon, but over the next 25 years, perhaps. But I think you're seeing a consensus among people that follow this cross ideological consensus that, that really the problem is the land use regulations and the sort of urban planning regime, regulatory regime that inhibits supply, the housing supply. So I'm generally optimistic about that. I think the, the real key thing is to figure out how you're going to connect to those people on the ground who maybe don't actually aren't actually so interested in, in uh, housing costs. So for example, if I'm a homeowner, homeowner in the Bay Area, I actually have a major incentive to keep the housing supply pretty tightly restricted because my number one investment in most cases is my house. So I actually kind of want to come up with reasons why we shouldn't allow new development. And you see this taking a variety of forms. So the economist William Fishel's home voter hypothesis, it's this idea of, of, at least in terms of planning, is that people who own homes, or uh, it's mainly individual homeowners, it's actually not landlords, according to the research that's been done, they go to urban planning meetings and they come up with a lot of reasons why we shouldn't allow new development. So sometimes this takes the form of um, environmentalism. So this idea, oh, we can't let more people in because it'll, it'll destroy the environment, it'll, it'll destroy these valuable farms that we have on the periphery of the community, or they'll come and say something like, we have to preserve community character. So in, in, for example, Boulder, Colorado, you're seeing this quite a lot, where people are saying, you know, we have to preserve Boulder as a small town, even though there's this explosive demand for property in Boulder to live in Boulder. So the nice thing about a lot of the economics research on this is it kind of cuts through a lot of those reasons, and it gets right at really the clear reason why a lot of people support these restrictions, is that they directly benefit from it. It increases the value of their number one investment. And of course, there's also the, the seen and the unseen. I think there's another component of this, that, that those people go to the urban planning meetings and they complain, but the potential resident, uh, maybe the new college grad in, let's say, Lexington, Kentucky, who would like to move to San Francisco, that person does not show up at the planning meeting. And so I think you're going to have to, there needs to be a broader conversation about making the case to those people who have every interest in restricting the supply as to why they shouldn't. Yeah, they, I mean, the other word for those people is uh, NIMBYs, not in my backyard. And there's sort of an interesting tension between the NIMBYs and affordable housing advocates. And the, I think a lot of governments, especially, you know, local governments sort of 
thread that needle, they they give the NIMBYs their supply restriction, and then they give a subsidy to demand, you know, that we subsidize low-income renters on the demand side to satisfy the affordable housing people. And of course, you know, if you just picture the supply and demand curves here, you're shifting the supply in and the demand up. And so, you know, the effect on the quantity of housing, that's going to be neutral or am ambiguous, but the effect on the price is unambiguously upward. You just, you push up prices with the right hand and with the left. And yeah, I mean, well, I think you mentioned it, that there's, um, they'll put requirements on developers, for instance, to to make 30% affordable units. When you build a new apartment building and you need X percentage of affordable units, uh, what, what's the problem with that approach to making housing affordable? Well, I would say in general, the problem with the subsidized approach is, is just that it creates just a really superficially small amount of units. I mean, you look at a lot of these housing programs and you actually, if you look at how many units they're actually creating, it, it's pretty like comically small. So for example, in a lot of high demand cities, you need like thousands of uni new units coming online. You basically need to see the kind of development that you see in most Southern cities, most Texas cities, possibly more. A lot of these housing programs, they'll create something like 100 units, 250 units a year. And those units will be touted, they'll be in brochures, they'll be maybe, you know, brought up in hearings on the program, but it's really not enough. The only way that you would get the amount of development that you actually need would be to actually liberalize the market and let the market respond to rising and falling demand for housing. The particular problem with inclusionary zoning would be that it's basically a tax on new development, as I was, as I was saying. That cost has to be the cost of the lost rent has to be incurred uh, or is incurred by the, the developer. So the developer will find ways to offset that cost. And the main way is to build more luxury units right, and, and to build more and more expensive units. So again, that's just a further restriction on development that, you know, you can't build an apartment building, let's say, unless you're going to make so much money that 30% of it can basically not make you any money. So that's a problem. And again, I think it's, it's part of this seen and unseen. When you require an affordable unit because of inclusionary zoning, you see the affordable unit. You create a constituency that lives in those affordable units. But what you don't see is all the apartment buildings that aren't built because they're not financially sustainable in a system where they basically have to give away 30% of their units. Texas is a good example of a place that, and Houston in particular, a place that allows the supply of housing to be much more elastic than other places in North America. Whereas California is the, the, at the opposite extreme, especially coastal California, where they have these, these open space laws and they're, and they vigorously protect these coastal cities from basically from having poor people move in and live there. And one sort of interesting thing about all this is that U-Haul of course, they, they rent out moving vans, and if you want to move from California to Texas, you know, you rent rent the van, you load all your stuff in it, and then you drop it off at another U-Haul location there in Texas. And But, you know, U-Haul doesn't just drive it right back to California. They they Hopefully, they'd like to rent it out to someone in Texas who is now moving to California so they can keep a good level of U-Haul trucks at both locations. And the interesting thing is that the price of renting a U-Haul in Texas and taking it to California is, I have to look it up, but it's, it's virtually zero because they have just no demand for U-Haul trucks to move from Texas <laughs> to California because nobody can afford it, right? Nobody can sell their ho home in Texas and then go buy one in California unless they just won the lottery or, or you know, got hired to be an executive at Google or have some other sort of win windfall uh, gain in income. I, another aspect to the puzzle, you might say, is uh, I, I sort of I talked to a civil engineer here in Vancouver, and he told me about something the city does when they rezone land. So the justification, they, they'll basically bargain with the developer over the extra surplus that's created when they rezone the land. Say it's it's zoned for some sub not very valuable use like you know a couple single family homes and the developer wants to come in and build a high rise and 
basically they'll they'll say, well, you know, you didn't really create the value that comes from this rezoning. So how about you give a bunch of that to us? And they part of this person's job, I think, was to to bargain up high enough that the project would still go through, but the city could capture as much of the surplus as possible. And I mean, he thought it was a great thing because, you know, we could take this money and fund, you know, new developments of, uh, you know, expand the transportation system or, or whatever. But to me, it kind of sounded like uh, nice land you got there would be a shame if something were to happen to it, kind of. Mm-hmm. So there, there's this rent seeking aspect to zoning where you, you, the city government, the city council, who's always looking for new sources of income, you have this ability to, you know, we're, we can prevent new value from being created. And, you know, the fact that we hold the key to the rezoning, it not only does it, you have people coming to you and, and lobbying you, and there's all sorts of benefits to that, but, you know, you can, sometimes you can just outright say, look, I have this valuable thing. Look, I have a veto over your business. Pay me and I'll, I'll let you... <laughs> I'll let you create value for other people. Yeah, I, I definitely say, I mean, it, this is maybe another case of, of a policy that had once been reasonable that I think has sort of gotten a little bit out of control. You know, it's, it seems to me reasonable to that you would have maybe a development be if a new development is going to require, let's say, a road upgrade or a sewage upgrade, uh, something to that effect. That strikes me as reasonable, right? The developers having to incur the costs of their development. But as you mentioned, a lot of cities are using this as basically just revenue generation, which is terrible. Ideally, you would want most revenue generation to come from a, you know broad taxes. You wouldn't want to actually punish a specific form of activity, particularly providing houses. Back to your point about moving from California to Texas, um, as much as I want to be a cheerleader for Texas, it, it's, it's got a lot of excellent policy in this regard. It's not perfect by any means, but it's, I think it's a lot better than a lot of the coastal states, you know, this is uh, still kind of a sad thing, right? I mean, there are probably a lot of people who would prefer to live in California. Maybe they would even like to live in an apartment in California, and they can't afford to live there because of restrictions. I'm happy that there's Texas that's there that's reasonably flexible with land use regulation that they can go to, but still, it's it's not the ideal. And another component of that, too, is that workers are having to leave high productivity areas. So, for example, a low-skill worker might be able to, you know, create a lot of value in the Bay Area. And the only reason they would leave is because they can't afford housing. The aggregate effect of that hurts the U.S. economy. Uh, you probably see something very similar in the Canadian economy, too, where low-skill workers can't afford to live in, let's say, Vancouver. And so they have to move to a lower productivity city. And they might have a better life there. But the aggregate effects of, of workers who could be more productive in one city moving to another low-productivity city is it hurts the the global the, you know the national economy. So, you know, there's the individual concern of of people are not allowed to live the way they want to live. But then there's also the effect that the it hurts everyone. It makes everyone poor. So, it's good that we have some states that are still relatively open with land use regulation, but really the push needs to be to have that sort of liberalization everywhere. Yeah, I I'm glad you mentioned that. There's a recent uh, there's some recent research by uh, an economist at uh, Nobel laureate, I believe, named Deaton. And uh, he basically showed that unlike past, sh- there's throughout the past, you know, economies always, there are always shocks, you know, things outside things, there's oil price shocks and trade shocks and shocks because of wars. And usually economies can recover from them fairly quickly. You had an economy that had, you know, several industries that worked well when the oil was. Uh, oil price was low and then the oil price went up so people got laid off but then they moved and they went somewhere else and they took on got hired into new industries but what Deaton basically showed is that uh the liberalization of trade with China around uh, I believe 2001 created a shock in for the US economy from which it basically didn't recover like a lot of people a lot of workers who were maybe, maybe they're around 50, they were going to work another 15 years. This shock hits uh, and industries like the furniture industry just sort of in the United States, they just sort of go away because China can just produce furniture much cheaper. And I think most economists would say, well, you know, you have all these people and they'll, they'll get hired somewhere else. But for the most part, what happened is they, they didn't get hired. They went on on welfare or disability 
and and then they they retired when when that was up and there was just no adjustment and there was a big debate about why this was but it really seems like inelastic housing supply is a big part of it so you live in a a town that has you know its main industry is producing furniture then the furniture factory goes under and not only do you lose your job but you lose all the value in your home because nobody wants to come live in a town with no industry and in the past you would have moved somewhere else but now you know you can't sell your home and buy a new one in california because your home is worth pennies and the ones in california are worth millions so there's there's really no sort of the level of labor mobility in the united states is just so much lower now that home prices are much higher in in many places and so yeah that's a a cost that maybe we wouldn't have anticipated that now that like not only is housing people's biggest expense and so you know just on its face making it more expensive makes them worse off but it's made the whole economy less dynamic right yeah and i think this gets to the broader problem treating housing as an investment ed glazer there was recently um one of these conversations on the new york times talking about whether or not we should be worried about home the home ownership rate being down and i think the popular urban economist ed glazer i think rightly made the case that that there are things that are lost when you have a high ownership, home ownership rate. So, for example, you're much less mobile. And mobility is, is very important for, you know, keeping the economy functioning correctly. They should be moving from low productivity areas to high productivity areas. This is what has happened through most of human history, right? Like famously, the, the first Great Migration, where African Americans en masse left the South to go to northern industrial cities. And there was no significant development, as I understand, in the South. But just by moving to northern cities, they dramatically improved their living standards by being able to, you know, work in factories, earn higher wages, much higher wages than they would have in the South. When you don't have people leaving areas where there are no jobs and moving into areas where there are a lot of high paying jobs, and in San Francisco, there are high paying jobs for every skill set. As we were saying, it it hurts the, the U.S. economy, it hurts the national economy in general. And the housing is, is, is an interesting component, too, because in a lot of cases, it's been heavily subsidized. At least in the U.S., mortgages are heavily subsidized. There are all these policies that encourage you to treat it as your main investment. So, for example, there's the mortgage interest deduction. In many cases, house, house home sales are exempt from capital gains taxes until they, I think it's something like $250,000 in profit from the sale. So it's, there are all these programs that encourage people to plow all their money into a home. And as you were saying, it's actually not that good of an investment. If you live in a town where maybe there are only a few employers and one of them leaves, that could destroy the value of your home. And that's if that's your only investment, not only is that your savings, that's your retirement, that's your ability to sell the home and move to a nicer area, that's your ability to, to sell the home and buy a smaller home. There are so many problems with this. And, and that's why you, know, you look at cities like Detroit, people just abandon the homes because they, they, they actually just can't resell them. Yeah, I think it's this is sort of what's fun and, 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 and not so fun about land use regulation and housing policy is that there's this whole web of policies that that are connected. And there are large constituencies for nearly every bad policy, right? So current homeowners who are in areas that are doing very well like all these policies. And for them, this this uh, maybe this mythology of a nation that buys homes and invests all their savings into their homes and then sells them and gets a big payout. That has worked for some people, but it hasn't worked for a lot of people. And so this is, you're, you're really seeing the, you know, regions go in very different directions based on this. Yeah. And just from the standpoint of finance in general, you probably don't want one huge asset that is 30% or, or 40% or, or even higher of your portfolio. And not to mention if as in my furniture factory example, it's correlated with your earnings, your labor earnings. So it's not even a good hedge against losing your job. I, I think Robert Schiller did a did a really he's an economist at Yale and and recently won the Nobel Prize. But he did a really did us all a service by creating a an index for for housing prices. And so you know there's the Case Schiller index, and there's now um, futures markets where you could in principle, hedge against 
the market fluctuations in your home price. So if you if you were going to buy a home, you could at least hedge use the futures market to hedge against the possibility of your home price going down. But let's face it, most people are not going to do that and and so they when their home price goes down, their standard of living just takes a nosedive with it. Do you have any closing thoughts about market urbanism, zoning, or any of the issues we've talked about? Well, I, I think it's been a lot of doom and gloom in this conversation, but I remain pretty optimistic for a few reasons. I think that my feeling is that we've reached a point, at least with a lot of cities, where things have gotten so bad that there's going to have to be some form of correction in terms of a critical mass of people saying we have to build more housing. And I think you're already starting to see that with the growing YIMBY movement. So this is the opposite of NIMBY. These are people who would say yes in my backyard. You're already starting to see that becoming more common. And I also think that millennials in particular are going to be a constituency, hopefully for more development, because in many cases, we're either graduating college or you know graduating high school and entering the workforce and moving out and discovering a housing market that is completely out of whack, discovering that many cities, you know, even outside of the, the two big ones that we've been talking about, or the three, Vancouver, San Francisco, and New York, even in maybe cities more like uh, Boston or cities like D.C., finding that, that rents are really uh, high and in many cases they're unsustainable for people just entering the labor force, particularly low skill workers. So I think there would be a growing constituency there. And I, I generally think that maybe there's a sort of shift in preference now. I think we're I think we're moving further and further away of this ideal of mandated low density housing. I think that there will always be people who want to live that way, but I think that there's been more and more demand among people who maybe grew up in those forms of development that are now more interested in urban living, right? There's been all this talk in the press and there's a big debate about whether or not young people want to live in cities or not, but I think it's clear that there at least is some group of people that wants to live in these mixed use, uh, higher density areas. And Cities are going to have to compete to provide that, especially cities that maybe need an influx of population. They need more people. They've lost more people. Rust Belt cities. One of the big benefits of Rust Belt cities is that they have very low housing costs. They could potentially build on that by getting rid of a lot of these regulations that prevent the construction of nice urban areas. A lot of the times, one of their biggest assets in the case of a place like uh, maybe, you know, let's say Pittsburgh or Buffalo, is that they have really... Uh, they have nice traditional old downtowns that were built up mostly before a lot of these strict land use regulations came into effect. So liberalizing that, I think there will be an incentive there'll be an incentive for certain groups to put pressure on it, renters and people who are priced out of the market. I think that the moral case is becoming clear that that people are actually getting kicked out of their neighborhoods in some cases because the restrictions are so tight citywide. But then there's also the incentive for policymakers in cities. If you want to build a great city, in a lot of cases, you're going to need to get rid of these requirements. You can't have a great downtown if every new development has to have a giant parking lot. You can't have a great downtown if the only form of development that you permit is a single family home surrounded by a giant yard. So I think that there will be more pressures on policymakers to get up to date on this policy. And two, I think that there's the potential to learn from cities that are booming because they have more liberal land use regulations. So I would say we need to be more clear about how cities like maybe Houston or other cities throughout the, the Sun Belt that are more, more open to new development, they're benefiting enormously from it. And they're not just benefiting in terms of population growth, they're benefiting in terms of, you know, they have more dynamic communities. It's not just affluent people who can live in the city. You have people of all incomes. You have immigrants coming into a lot of these cities. You have a large population of Latin American and East Asian or Southeast Asian immigrants coming into places like Texas. And that creates a, a better city. It creates a more diverse city. It creates a, a nicer place to be. And a lot of that is uh, only possible because housing costs are low and there are a lot of different housing options for potential residents. So I think I, I remain optimistic. I think there are a lot of pressures on policymakers and voters to get this right. Always good to end on a positive note. My guest today has been Nolan Gray. Uh, Nolan, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Well, thanks for having me. As I mentioned earlier, you can find the show notes page for this episode at economicsdetective.com slash trailer. 
I'd really like to see some discussion on those pages. So if you have thoughts about the episode, if you want to comment on anything my guest has said, you can go there and leave a comment. And of course, I will read it and I'll most likely respond. Special thanks to my latest Patreon supporter, Alexi. Uh, Alexi and others have help to make economics detective radio what it is and in particular since i reached the point now where i can start to outsource more of my activities i've been able to record many more interviews and i'll be able to now release them at a consistent schedule of one per week you know if i get a whole lot more money maybe i could even increase that even more Uh, no promises but it's a possibility And I really want to thank the people who support me that way because I love doing this. In particular, I love doing the interviews, but there are some parts of it I don't love, like editing. And I can now afford to not do those things. So it's uh, great for me and hopefully it's great for you because you get more content to consume. Content's free, but you can still help if you so choose. Go to economicsdetective.com slash support to do that.